Hi, I'm Julia Hamm, President and CEO of the Smart Electric Power Alliance, and I am here today with Pedro Pizarro, who is President and CEO of Edison International, the parent company of Southern California Edison. Pedro, thanks so much for joining me. Hey, thanks for having me on, Julia. Yeah, so you guys have been leaders for such a long time in the deployment of clean energy. You've got a huge focus now on helping to electrify uh, the transportation system in particular, as well, there, as well as other parts of the economy, and a real focus on uh, helping us make progress on decarbonization. Talk to me a little bit about what have been the primary drivers in recent years for those decisions the company has been making. Well, you know, thanks, Julia. And I think it really starts with the fact that all of us, not just California, not just the U.S., but really the whole world, we're all dealing with a major looming crisis of climate change. And uh, being in the state of California with, for most of our operations, we do have a state here that is committed to policies that will help the world and certainly our state do something about that to decarbonization. So when you think about the history in California, going back to nearly 20 years ago in the first days of the renewable program, and you fast forward to today, uh, as we look at what it will take to achieve our targets for the state, our targets for the company, which are all consistent with the uh, tenets of the uh, Paris Accord, mm -hmm. focusing on, say, the 2045 endpoint of a decarbonized California economy, we see that there's going to be a need for significant use of clean energy, really for 100% of uh, you know, retail sales. Uh, it's a little complicated and we can get into that because that doesn't mean that there isn't a single fossil fuel molecule out there, but it does mean that net net, uh, you have 100% clean energy. And then you use that clean electricity to electrify a lot of the economy where today we are burning fossil fuels. So, uh, you know, de uh, decarbonizing the transportation sector, decarbonizing, you know, building use, uh, leading to, in our view, something like 75% of electric uh, of vehicles having to be electric in 2045, and 70% of buildings having to uh, shift their space and water heating to electric use. So doing that will require a massive build out in terms of additional renewables, in terms of additional storage, we can, we can get into that further, but really that driver is really doing something about climate change. Oh, by the way, that helps build the economy, that helps create new jobs, uh, and this is something that in California, at least, is supported by 70% of the voting public in poll after poll. Yeah, so here we are today, you know, working from home, talking to each other from our homes, as everyone else is doing, uh, because of COVID-19. How do you see today's situation potentially impacting those drivers that you talked about? So I think the impacts are real, but I believe there will be near-term, maybe mid-term impacts, not long-term impacts. And here's what I mean. In the near term, there are certainly impacts because we are having to do our work uh, on screen, right? like you and I are doing right now. Uh, you think about our own workforce, we have 13,000 employees, about two thirds of those are teleworking, about a third are still out there in the field, climbing poles, keeping the lights on. Uh, when you think about some of the near term activities, uh, installing more uh, renewable facilities, uh, deploying electric vehicle chargers, there clearly is a near term impact on the ability to do that physical work, so that's a slowdown. It's been concerning to read, for example, the uh, impacts on auto manufacturers who've seen their manufacturing lines have to slow or stop for some period because of you know the adjustment to physical distancing rules and uh, there have been articles uh, just in the last week that i've seen around a number of automakers saying that they're going to have to delay when they're going to be bringing on specific models back out all of those are near and midterm impacts and there's one more which is just the impacts on the economy uh, just yesterday uh, governor newsom in california uh, shared that the Department of Finance is now estimating that the state budget, which 60 days ago looked like it had a $6 billion surplus for this year, will end up with something like a $54 billion deficit over the next several years. Those are real impacts. We're seeing unemployment figures right now that are officially 15% or so. There's estimates that those could be more like 20 or 30% uh, ultimately. So that will have a near to midterm impact because it means that Consumers will uh, not be as able maybe to buy that next car as an electric car 
next month, maybe that's next year, uh, or replacing the water heater or what have you. Long term, however, I don't think there is a change to the drivers because while we have the COVID-19 crisis right, right now, we still have to deal with the climate change crisis. Mm -hmm. right? That's not going away. And, and it's been actually reassuring to see a number of folks writing about how actually our global and national response to COVID-19, I mean, a number of things could be better, but you've seen humanity come together to deal with this. And we need to use that as a template for how humanity comes together to deal with the climate change crisis. And so that science is not going to change. That need is not going to change, and I believe that the driver and the commitment to it won't change. One more quick point on that is that uh, if you look at the California example again, uh, you probably saw that Governor Newsom set up a task force on uh, jobs and business recovery. Mm -hmm. uh, around 100 folks, and I'm lucky enough to be one of the folks on there, the, the only person from the electric sector, uh, electric utility sector, to be on the task force. Uh, from the get go, from Governor Newsom's announcement of it, to his first meeting with us, to the comments by the co-chairs, you know, Tom Steyer and Anna O'Leary, they really have set out twin objectives of dealing with the near-term, mid-term economic recovery, but also making sure that that economic recovery leads to one that has a just and equitable transition for everybody, right? That's inclusive, and that is focused on the long-term needs of the economy, which include the transition to clean energy and electrification. Yeah, th that is fantastic. And actually it ties right into where I wanted to take the conversation with us. So it's, it's great that California is coming at this from a balanced perspective, of both the short term and the long term. I'd love to hear from you as the leader of a large company. You know, what advice do you have for other leaders on how, how do you strike that right balance of taking care of the urgent, important issues in front of you and your employees and your customers today, but also not losing sight of making progress on those long-term, equally important strategic issues, including uh, you know, really helping to, to mitigate climate change? So now for a quick lesson on juggling. <laughs> <laughs> uh, look, the reality is that uh, or most of my hours right now, let me make this personal, most of my hours right now uh, over the past, certainly the last couple of months have been spent on uh, the near term issues, right? Making sure we're taking care of our employees, making sure we're taking care of our communities, right? Keeping the power flowing for hospitals and critical facilities. We've done a number of things to help our customers through this, like suspending disconnections and dealing with payment plans and all of that. Uh, but we have also retained some mind share, you know, just myself, but our leadership team around, okay, how do we start reframing and, and rethinking, we retain those long-term objectives, but now think about what that implementation pathway looks like in the short term, in the midterm, to make sure we can still get to that end point, right? And so, you know, we, we've done things like, uh, uh, carve out people, right? Then we have a we have a whole incident management team structure that's dealing with the near-term response. We've also set up a separate future planning cell that is focused on longer-term impacts, not the super long, right? But they're looking at a month ahead, two or three months ahead. How will we change the way that we work? How do we make sure that these lessons we learn in teleworking um, don't just get forgotten? But we actually, whenever we have most of our folks go back, do most of our folks go back and what lessons do we retain so that uh, you know, we, we have a new way of working that's more flexible and more sustainable? By the same token, we've also kept some mind share on particularly the policy issues around the clean energy transition and our, our pathway 2045 thinking. And we've been heartened to see the CPUC, uh, the Public Utilities Commission in California, you know, continue their work across all fronts. Like us, big focus on the near term things, but number of other proceedings are still, you know, clicking along because the work still has to be done. And, you know, one final framing on this is that when you think about the milestones that the state has set up, 40% uh, reduction in greenhouse gas emissions from 1990 levels by 2030, carbon neutrality by 2045, those sound like they're really far away, but they're not. We're sitting here in 2020, 2030 is 10 years away. When you think about the massive um, restructuring of the economy that needs to take place to get to 2030, you know, we estimate 
California will need something like seven and a half million electric vehicles on the road by 2030 with all the charging infrastructure and the whole ecosystem around them, right? Uh, that's a long ways from where we are today as a state. Uh, similarly, for the additions in clean power or in storage that will be needed. Uh, 2045, right? We estimate that the state will need something like uh, at least 80 gigawatts of new renewables developed and 30 gigawatts of storage resources. You saw that we took a, a next step at Southern California Edison uh, last week with the announcement of 770 megawatts in new storage contracts, right? Uh, but, but that means that we can't be in pilot mode right now. We need to be taking big steps now to get to 2030 and 2045. Time is short. We recognize there may be some period of delay brought on from COVID. That means that we're going to have to accelerate that curve further um, in, the, in the following years. And that means that we can't turn our brains off at this point on those objectives. So we've, we've kept you know, some folks uh, focused on continuing to work on that, even as most of our team is focused on the near-term COVID response. Mm -hmm. No, that's, that's great practical advice, Pedro. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for taking the time to talk with us, but more importantly, thank you for your leadership uh, for, in California, but nationally and globally, everything that you're doing to help move us towards a carbon-free energy future. But thank you well, again. Julia, thank you. And thanks for, for what SEPA does. You guys do great work and uh, keep it up. We need it. Thanks for watching. This is just one in a series of interviews I'm doing with utility CEOs across the country. I hope you'll watch some more. You can visit our website at sepapower.org or visit our YouTube channel.